What was also hugely significant was the fact that the five star animals produced almost 20% less methane than the one star animals. So this really represents a huge potential benefit for all stakeholders in the cattle breeding industry as these high index animals, they're both more profitable for the farmer economically and also been much more environmentally friendly than the low index animals. Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and on this week's episode, I'm joined by Niall Kilrain from ICBF Tully Test Performance Centre to give an update from the Research Centre. Niall, you're very welcome. Can you give an update for listeners what's happening in Tully Research Centre at the moment? The Tully Test Centre is the National Commercial Progeny Test Centre located at the edge of Kildare Town. And I suppose historically, pedigree bull breeders back in the day used to bring their young bulls to the centre for performance testing. But following a review maybe around 2011, ICBF then began to purchase the commercial progeny of new AI sires that have been progeny tested themselves through the Gene Ireland Breeding Programme. And at any one time, there may be around 200 animals on site. And to date, we have put almost 5,000 commercial animals through the centre. Um, these animals, I suppose, are a mixture of bulls, steers and heifers from both suckler and dairy dams. Um, the data we capture is in a growth rate, feed efficiency, methane emissions and even meat eating quality. Um, we're also in the early stages of setting up a system that will capture the water intakes of the animals. And some of these traits have a direct impact on the genetic evaluation of the AI sire concerned, while some of the data is in its infancy, but could be extremely useful in the future. And all this work is really only possible through a strong and deep collaboration with our industry partners, which are herd owners, the AI companies, breed societies and the, the Department of Agriculture. You mentioned there, Niall, that ICBF began to purchase the commercial progeny of new AI sires. How are those animals sourced? Yeah, so that's actually a large part of my role in terms of the the, the sourcing piece. So the animals for the centre are sourced directly from commercial herds across the country. So these are the suckler and the dairy farmers that are using the packs of the, the dairy or the beef straws from the new AI bulls, which are distributed through the Gene Ireland programme. And I suppose the fact is a key pillar of the programme is that we have a centralised database. So ICBF have one centralised database which allows us to have sight of every animal in the country from birth right through to slaughter. And this allows us to capture on-farm data such as calving, growth rate, fertility. And when we want to purchase the animals, the relevant animals for Tully, we can come in then, purchase them, get them delivered to the farm and, and capture the hard-to-measure traits I mentioned previously, like the feed efficiency, the methane and the meat eating quality. And the animals are acclimatized onto the finishing diet and maybe over the course of 30 days and then an intensive finishing system for approximately 70 days. A lot of farmers that were at the recent Newford Open Day would have seen the green feed system, Nile. You also have the green feed system in Tully. Can you describe how it works? Yeah, it's very much part of the, the new suite of um tools we have at our disposal to capture data and there's about 10 green feed machines in active service around the country and they're being very carefully managed by my colleague Kieran McDonald who's based in Tully. Um, so all the methane data that's captured in Tully is, is captured using these green feed machines. The animals are enticed into the unit with a very small amount of meal that drops at set intervals. Um, the animal is identified by machine through its um, RFID tag. So as the animal then consumes the feed, the air surrounding the animal's head is extracted via a fan. This is then passed through sensors and the value for each animal's methane emissions is determined. So the green feed system can also be used at grass. So now we can assess animals both at grass and indoors on a finishing diet in Tully. So there's a huge focus on, again, cross-industry collaboration. There's lots of various projects with Chagas and other industry partners using different farms and different systems. But I suppose that the, the end of the day, really, all the data is flowing back to the centralised database, and that's where the real power is to make sure that all the data is in one place and it's useful to all the industry partners then. So, Fire Nile, what is the methane data collected on animals showing? Yeah, so it's definitely very interesting. It's still in the early stages, but based on about 1,500 animals that have gone through the units, and that data is analysed by a colleague of mine, uh, Claude Ryan, and it's shown that the, the, the methane production is moderately heritable so it's around the same heritability as milk yield and this is positive from a very positive from a breeding perspective as at some point in the future we will be able to add methane into our breeding indexes 
And then this in turn can have the potential to reduce methane emissions by approximately 1% each year in our national cattle population. And it's an important point to make, I suppose, is that this reduction is both permanent and cumulative. It's permanent, I suppose, in the fact that you can't alter an animal's own genetics. Once you breed an animal for some for a trait, that those genetics are in that animal for its lifetime. And the cumulative side of it is in terms of once you breed for lower methane, the output will will reduce, the, the, the methane output will reduce from one generation to the next. So you're making incremental gains year on year, generation after generation. And if you took the, the example of milk yield and dairy cows, I mean, back in 1980, it was somewhere in the region of the average cow producing 3,000 litres. And that's moved on massively over the course of 40 odd years. It's over 5,000 litres per cow. It's the average milk production. So, you know, breeding has really helped farmers to produce higher yielding cows. And breeding going forward then can help reduce methane while still delivering in production performance through our multi-trait indexes. Um, so it's about having this balanced approach. You're really trying to hold what you have in terms of production, but may, may make gains on the traits that are more relevant in the environmental traits going forward. Um, there's also discussion around possibly recalculating current inventories for methane, that there's suggestions that maybe the, the current inventories are 10 to 20% overestimating the level of methane. So it'll be very interesting to get this current live data and hopefully have a very accurate picture for the industry going forward. That's very interesting, Niall. We've seen the recent difference in emissions from breeds. What is influencing this difference between the breeds? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. It's a, it's always a, a um, focus for farmers. that would say people have preferences for breeds. And in the, be- the, the beef industry in Ireland, there's probably you know, 13, 14 beef breeds. Everyone has their personal preferences. But really, the work of ICBF is it's not focused on individual breeds. What we're trying to, to zone in on is identifying the best animals, regardless of breed, for the traits of interest. So, And it is true that some breeds are stronger than others in certain traits. But the main learning is that there is a wide range in the animal population from the top to the bottom. Um, and historically, uh, this was the main focus for breeding programs was around traits like calving, growth rate, carcass. But definitely in recent years, the attention has turned to traits more maybe focused on the cost of production, like feed efficiency. And now we're moving into the environmental traits like methane production and even water intake. So the study that was done in Tully was looking at methane output from a finishing diet it's a very short window, really, 70 to 90 days in the last few days or the last few months of an animal's life. But following up research from the Greenfeed study is looking at the full life cycle of different types of cattle within different environments. You know, grass from the spring, grass in the summer and the autumn, differences in the feed composition from grass to um, silage. And we need to collect this methane data from cattle as, as they consume these different diets throughout their lifetime. And that will give us a holistic understanding of the, the genotype crossed with the environmental interaction. And that's, you know, really the honours class in terms of capturing a, a whole whole picture of what's happening in these animals' lives. And this is what's happened at the minute at various sites around Ireland. Um, and by selecting the low emitters of methane within each breed, we can improve the economic traits of interest combined with a robust breeding program, which we have in place. The worst breed today could be the best breed in 10 years time because we're making these gains by identifying both the top and the bottom animals within the population. And you also mentioned, Niall, there that meat quality work has also been carried out. What results are you seeing from that? Yeah, that's an interesting one, Catherine. All the animals that go through Tully are also assessed for meat eating quality. Um, now, there is market research that has shown that if a consumer has a negative experience eating beef, it can be six weeks before they purchase beef again. You know, so it can really have a very direct impact on consumers' decisions, purchasing decisions. So combined with this is the fact that there is decline in beef consumption within the EU when you compare it to maybe pork and chicken. And then to address these trends, it's critical that we develop systems to help improve the actual eating quality of beef for the traits like tenderness, juiciness and flavour, which are of value to consumers. Um, so this is where the ICBF come in and we're using pedigree and DNA information along with other pieces of information such as the animal's gender, their herd of origin and genetic evaluations for each of the three meat quality traits are now being generated. Um, so these genetic evaluations are presented as an expected satisfaction rating of the progeny from a given sire. Um, the average expected rating for each trait is 80%. So that means that 80% of the progeny are expected to have a satisfactory tender, flavorness, or juiciness score. 
So then the sires that are higher than this are expected to produce progeny with superior meat eating quality. Um, and then the range satisfaction values from even within AI sires can go from 70% to 90%. And that's similar to other traits that while there is clear breed differences, they do exist. Critically is the fact that there is a range in meat eating quality, both within and across breed. So you have some um, animals, regardless of their breed, that are very good and others that are very poor for meat for eating quality. And, and an important point to remember is that all this information is published on our website, www.icbf.com. So anyone that's interested can really go in there and access that information very, very easily. That's great, Niall. I suppose, finally, a recent trial of 841 suckler bred steers that went through Tully. Can you describe how the trial was conducted and what did you find? Yeah, it's very interesting now that we have the numbers there to carry out very robust analysis. So, as I said, there was over 5,000 cattle have gone through Tully and my colleague Stephen Conroy, he pulled out a sample of about 840 suckler bred steers within the overall population of animals. And he carried out an analysis on them on their trial period for the various traits recorded while they were in Tully. So he divided them then up based on their star ratings, their terminal index at the start of the trial. And what was found was that the star rating system was well able to and very accurately, correctly rank the animals in line with how they actually performed themselves. So the indexes were saying that they were predicting to do certain things. And when the animals actually went through the, the centre, they did perform as predicted. So he found that there was a one euro 15 cent per day difference in the feed cost and 140 euros difference in carcass value in favour of the five star versus the one star animal. So that's quite significant. When you put that at individual level, it's 140 per head. You multiply that across thousands of animals and thousands of herds, it gets into significant money very, very quickly. So I suppose the five-star animals really were more feed efficient. They had heavier carcasses and better kill-out percentages than the one-star animals. What was also hugely significant was the fact that the five-star animals produced almost 20% less methane than the one-star animals. So this really represents a huge potential benefit for all stakeholders in the cattle breeding industry as these high-index animals, they're both more profitable for the farmer economically and also being much more environmentally friendly than the low-index animals. And with the structures we have in place at the minute, we are now able to move the national herd in the desired direction. And the challenge is really how quickly can we make the required progress? So that's on us all within the industry to see how do we ensure that these high index animals are what is selected in the, the national breeding programs. And again, all this data, as I said, is widely available in public domain on our website, www.icbf.com. That's great, Niall. Thanks very much. Some real interesting information coming from the Tully Research Centre in County Kildare. Thanks, Catherine. That's all for this week's episode. And my thanks to Niall for joining me on the show. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.